I'm your host, Pirate Ryan Manning, on the Bamsters Rated R Show. We've got booty. Hello, boys and girls. Today, I have been entrusted with you to release the A Block by myself. I don't know why these guys trust me so much to actually release the A Block. And someone's mowing the lawn outside. Great! You can listen to the guy mow the lawn as well. Brilliant. As you guys probably already know, my name is Bam. I've been absent for about a month. Due to reasons that I don't really want to go into right now, but I am back. I have returned and I am just as mentally challenged as always as uh, people might find this one out soon enough. So, news this week is rather boring, rather uninteresting, to be brutally honest. When it comes to real life news, I don't really care. They found a planet, however, in the spacey type of news and things, and it's like a super Earth, which is like smaller than Neptune but bigger than Earth and it's got water and rocky bits and you know they're gonna have super giants on that place but that's really it uh, there's nuclear missiles or missiles being stopped being operated in South Korea which I don't really want to talk about because that just makes me want to hate Earth you know the planet but but now we will go into news of, of more of a gaming nature since we are a gaming channel and forget about the real world and fold lovely into the world of games you know it's, it's a lovely form of escapism right now as you know as I'm a PS4 player so I'm gonna go into the PS4 stuff quickly so PlayStation 4 let's see let's see aha uh -huh. maze free PlayStation games arrived today I believe so here we go and the free games are Ugh. Ugh. nothing looking particularly any good really laser disco defenders tales of from the borderlands which actually i might actually play that one so scratch that and then type rider okay never mind uh ps3's blood knight and uh port royal 3 yeah I'm, I'm gonna run away and do that one so let's go to xbox you know our uh, estranged brothers yeah let's see let's see hmm hmm nothing at all Let's go to Switch, which I have to because I've been told to go to Switch. Uh, New Zelda, no, boring. <laughs> Sorry, Drac, Zelda's boring, dude. It's just, a, it's just a, uh, honestly, Zelda's a, uh, uh, I want to say it's a cut cross. Um, what's a game I used to like to play? Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a cut cross Skyrim. Honestly, that's what Zelda is. And the only reason why people buy it now is because nostalgia. Nostalgia. Ooh, Zelda, nostalgia. No, mate, it's Skyrim. That's what it is. And to be honest, Bethesda do a much better job of implementing than, than Nintendo. Honestly, it, it's 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 uh, uh, a PG rated 13 version of, of uh, Skyrim. And who the hell wants to play a, a PG 13 version of Skyrim? Exactly, people like Zelda. There we go. That's that's basically it. Uh, for me, that's basically news, guys. Boring as always, but yes. Uh, if you guys want to talk about games, I've been playing lately. Mostly it's Paragon. And more Paragon. And a lot more Paragon. The devs seem to have fixed all their issues with the game. Uh, for me, anyway. I was a very big fan of Legacy. And I went to the... I went to the Monolith upgrade, or the update. And I hated it. I fucking hated it. I hated it. I couldn't gank. I couldn't lane, I couldn't do anything, and don't get me wrong, it was a, a tit for tat, I win a couple, lose a couple, win a couple, lose a couple, just recently though, however, I went to like a 16 game loss streak, I was like at the kryptonite, nobody wants to game with me, nobody wants to run with me, because no matter what I did, I couldn't do a damn freaking thing, I tried to lane, I tried to off, I tried to uh, near, I tried to mid, I, I did try, I fucking tried, then I went into the jungle, and through the Deck Builder app on a friend's PC, I built a Grux deck. Now, it's a bit unorthodox. There's a couple of 8s, a few 9s, and a few 11s in there. Nothing's actually 12 or 10s. I have built myself a rather nasty Grux. There's a one or two tweaks that's happened in there. It was a, I used a Rage Heart engine. I've now gone from Rage Heart, engine, Rage Heart engine to, I think it's the Assassin's Ward, where it gives me all the benefits of the Rage Heart engine apart from mana regen. And I'll tell you what. This Grug hits hard and fast, uh, early to mid, but then late the big damage comes in and I've got to sacrifice speed for damage. 
So, yeah, but then I'm critting for, what, four, 450, so, and that's, what, 96% uh, crit chance, 100% uh, crit damage, and that's almost every single hit, so, yeah, boom. Oh, with that deck builder app, which I think is bloody brilliant that they've actually put this in, I've actually built myself a Murdoch deck as well, and I crit for 815. Now, I'm not sure whether I should take the eight, uh, take that 15 off and put some more attack speed into it, because I really feel Murdoch scales quite nicely with attack speed. Uh, and then just leave it at that. But when I got all primed, I crit for over a thousand. It's like one shot. There was a Revenant, there was a Rampage, even in Rampage Ultimate. Ultimate I, I one shot Revenant, I turned around, there was a Rampage, big and strong, walking along, and bang bang dead. You didn't even have enough time to jump and turn away. However, I did get melted by the yin. I couldn't hit that. I couldn't hit it. Could not hit that. Quite literally. <laughs> couldn't hit that. At all. The yin hit me from behind. As I turned around, she used her, like, I want to say her whip pull thing, and she pulled herself towards me. I couldn't see where the hell she ended up. There was a seraph. I got stressy. I let go of my shotgun round. I clipped the yin. Brought her down to, I don't know, quarter health. But by then, I was dead. The seraph, uh melted my face with the yin in the combo. That was a pretty good fight. Uh, however, back to the Grux. That Grux deck that I've built, no word of a lie, I've played two games and each game I've managed to come out with well over 15 kills and in each of those those games when I'm working with my team, I get quadra kills or penta kills. I think the last one was 20 and 3 and I got a penta kill. And that was a scary, scary game. I ran into the middle to defend uh, a friend of mine called Howler and he popped his ultimate, and they all try to run away. Not today, boys. Pulled them all back in, did my chop, my R1 chop, and uh, yeah. Yeah, they uh, they all melted. Howler didn't get any bloody kills, so I stole all four. <laughs> a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So yes, guys, that's basically it. I don't really have much things to tell you, really. Just uh, news type stuff and things. A quick seven minutes. All right, I've got to go on a little bit further. Okay, I've got to make this at least 12, so you guys are going to listen to me for a little bit longer. It's quite difficult not actually uh, being able to bounce off another Bamster. Yeah, Drac, I, I wish I had uh, listened to you earlier on in the week. Yes, but don't worry, mate, don't worry. I'll, uh, I'll forgive you. Uh, more like forgive me. Hey, I'm Ryan Manning from Bad Rhino Games, here to talk about Rising Tides on Bamster's Rated R Show. Right, so I've also been playing a little bit of Battlefield 4. Not Battlefield 1, yes, I have Battlefield 1, and I prefer Battlefield 4. I still, still to this day, uh, maintain that Battlefield 4 is a better game than Battlefield 1. Uh, purely, purely because there's helicopters. Now, I'm a big fan of RPG shits out the sky with my good old wingman power power mist or Bruce, you know. So, yeah, I, I have a lot of fun doing that. But in Battlefield 1, where the gameplays are somewhat a little bit different, a little bit um, uh, refreshing, I'll say. It's, it's, it's a quite refreshing to play Battlefield 1 sometimes. And the graphics are... Not the best. It, it, the graphics are delicious. Delicious graphics. But, to be brutally honest, in... My opinion, my humble, gobby opinion, graphics do not make a game. You could have the best looking game ever, but if it doesn't play well, and there's no story behind it, you've got yourself a lemon. A total lemon. So, Battlefield 4, yes, the campaign was crap. Battlefield 1, I still think the campaigns are crap, even though apparently the stories are true. I think they're poorly implemented. Poorly uh, acted, poorly, it's just, just a poor game. However, the multiplayer is what you really want, and the multiplayer is where all the action happens. Action? <laughs> action. <laughs> action happens. So, I prefer Battlefield 4. It, it seems a bit more intense, a bit more. Uh, the gameplay I tend to play is more engineer class in Battlefield 4, but when it comes to Battlefield 1, it's more the medic slash snipper. Now, I don't really run the long distance snipper because I can't shoot for shit. I tend to run close snipper because I prefer the one shot kill bang don't have to deal with you anymore bang don't have to deal with you anymore bang don't have to deal with you anymore run 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 bang don't have to deal with you anymore then you get the medic and the medic just picks up people pick 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 that's what you do run around with a pistol and your um, your 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 haha <laughs> your injection bang stabby stabby and yeah that, that's how I tend to run it but Battlefield 4 is a better game I do think Battlefield 4 is a better game and I can see why the Battlefield 4 servers are so popular 
Battlefield 1 servers, not so much. But then if you look at the the movement from Battlefield 4, went to Hardline, there was a huge spike for Hardline because it was a massive, massive interest in Hardline because, you know, cops and robbers and more urban fights. And everyone was thinking, oh, yeah, we're going to get a much better game. Uh, uh, turn it about turn, everyone back to Battlefield 4 and the, and the uh, Hardline servers nearly, nearly freaking hit the floor. And then the same thing for um, Star Wars. You know, Battlefield, but the Battlefront ones. Now, I am and was a huge fan of the Battlefront series. I played online with the Xbox 360 and I fucking loved it. Battlefront 1, loved it on the PlayStation. My PlayStation had an accident in the North Atlantic when I might have taken it to my um, department and I might have uh, dropped it and fell over the side of the ship. But it doesn't matter. I went to an Xbox 360 then because the 360 was better than the PlayStation at the time. Got better front too. Played it online. Loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. The droids I was a bit frustrated with, but you take the, the, the shock troopers with that big ass cannon of theirs, and it was just a lot of fun to play. A lot of fun to play. And now you get the Battlefront, and you can see where the graphics, um, the, 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 the upgrade in graphics came from, and why Battle, Battlefield 1 looks so good, because the graphics in Battlefield 1 look so delicious. And the, battle, the graphics for Battlefront look so delicious. But then you come up with these, they come up with these silly, the gameplay is fine, the story is fine, even though there was no story, but the gameplay is fine, you know the story so well, you don't need a story about it, just go play multiplayer. But then there's like, dioramas, and the dioramas are like, wait, what? Why do I want dioramas? What, why? What, what? I just want to play the game. It was story would have been nice, you know, a little bit of story here and there, it would have been nice, but, holy shit. Holy shit, it, all it was was graphics and nostalgia, which is similar to what I'm bringing back to, full circle, Zelda. Nostalgia, looking good, isn't a good game in my opinion. And now you've gone to Battlefield 1, which is like a bastardized, more version of, of Battlefield 4. Uh, and and I no, they have, they've actually kicked front um, hard, uh, Hardline out the freaking door, I do think. And I do think that it's more graphical from Battlefront with a bit of uh, Battlefield 4 game style in there. And this is the, the, the bastardized ginger stepchild that uh, everyone is playing now, and I've actually gone off it and played Battlefield 4. Granted, I have been having a few hiccups with Paragon, and uh, I have been hiccups more towards Paragon than Battlefield 4, but I still like playing Battlefield 4. Battlefield 4 is a bloody good game. Bloody good, I, you know, play the engineer class, man. Seriously, engineer class is the way to go. I only play the sniper class on one particular map, and that's Savoy, where I put the beacon, or the sneaky beacon, in a particular spot, and I just spawn from there, and I drop down upon these people like a fucking rabbit spider monkey. Yeah, yeah, the, those people don't know what the fuck hit them sometimes, because it just rocks up with a with a sniper holding a, a MTAR, and it goes melt, melt, reload, melt, melt, dead. Spawn back in, melt, melt, melt. Oh, you shot me off, melt, dead. Okay, spawn back in. The only problem is, because I use a tugs and a spawn beacon, I haven't got C4, so I can't deal with vehicles. This is where your teammates come into handy, particularly Bruce with his RPG, and Len with his uh, RPG, and oh wait, hang on, L with his RPG. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun playing with those guys. They just bring whatever suits the map, and whatever suits the situation. They don't necessarily play to a particular style. However, Len's a bit of a bastard with his medic class. He'll run out into the middle of the map, bullets flying, rounds hailing past you, and he'll run, and he'll revive you. Clink! Thanks for the revive. He'll revive you right in front of a tank turret. Yeah, boom, there goes your head, you're dead. But then, he's laughing his ass off when he's scuttling around the, the bushes and the tank can't see him no more. So yeah, that that was, uh, that that's his uh, particular place that we face medic. He'll revive you in the middle of god, god awful freaking hailing storms and stuff. So yeah, a lot of fun there, a lot of fun. Uh, Paragon is a good game. If, they, if you guys are watching this or listening to my me and my voice drone on for the past, I don't know, 12 minutes or so. Oh god, 12 minutes. Uh, you guys might want to try it again. The Monolith to Leg the Legacy to Monolith update and the subsequent updates have made the game good again. Paragon is good again. Epic have made Paragon good again. Uh, I do feel it's better. Uh, the initial update to Monolith was not good. You couldn't gank. I couldn't lane. I still can't bloody lane, to be honest. I kind of shit myself when I go laning. Uh, but I need a good support. And I do have a good support. A guy called Howler. 
Ray Rahihi Ruhu Ruhu I can't pronounce anyway. Bloody good Narbash. I've never seen an Narbash get so many kills ever. But you know, he's got a, a ranged attack called Thunk. Oh my god, the funniest thing ever is when, when an Narbash one hit kills a, a Yin with a Thunk. <laughs> Funniest thing, who'd have thought Muriels and Narbashes would be getting kills? Yeah, they need more medic, uh, I must say medic class, but they need more healers. They've only got two right now that are any good, which is obviously Muriel, which is which is a tank of fucking huge proportions, and Narbash, which is a health and mana regen station. You just rock up there, and, you, and all of a sudden you're full health, full mana, and you just go. And you five minutes on a lane with Narbash, you can then wander off into your jungle again, which I tend to do with Grok sometimes. I'm a bit low of taking on the gin of the <laughs> taking on the gingers. <laughs> taking on the uh, the jungle camps and I need to instead of porting back, I go spend five minutes in the lane helping out Raj, helping out left and helping out mid or whatever have you. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. See, full circle boys and girls, full circle. And yes, that's all the real news I really want to talk to you about. Games are great, I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, I'm having a lot of uh, fun talking to you guys, and I don't know why I've been left alone to my own devices when it comes to the A block today. Well, tonight rather, was someone mowing the lawn outside. Good lord, I didn't realise they was uh, mowing the bloody lawn. So guys, that is it for me. I really just want to talk to you guys about Paragon, some games. I really want to get my opinion out there about Zelda. Drac, get off the, the bargain basement kitty version of Zelda, of, 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 of uh, Skyrim. Seriously, bro. Come on, bro. Come on. Come play some real games. Yeah. Nintendo would be cool if they didn't bring out a bloody tablet. If I wanted a tablet gaming console, I'd buy a freaking Android something or, or an iPhone something. I wouldn't buy a Switch. You know, games on on the Play Store and Google Play are much more entertaining than those games you're getting currently on the Nintendo tablet, whatever have you. So, yeah, get off that, mate. Come come to the dark side. Be, I'll even let you play on your PC, Drac. I'll even let you play on your PC. So come, come back. Come back to the dark side. You've got a PlayStation 4 now after I've withered you into getting one. Come play some Paragon. Yeah, yeah, Paragon is, uh, is uh, dual platform. Anyway, anyway, that is it, guys. That is it for me. I've been waffling on for about 16 minutes now. You guys are probably about as annoyed and as bored as I am. So I'm going to go away and play some Paragon. But first, you guys need to hang around for a little bit longer. And uh, there is an interview coming up from a Bad Rhino Games. And the topic was, believe it or not, Rising Tides. It's a naval open world RPG. Now, Booker, myself, and Jason are Matlows. Now, if you don't know what a Matlow is, it's basically a British, a British sailor. And the astute among you might realize I am not a British or have a British accent. If you guys think I do, you guys need to have your ears reworked or something. Anyway, I've been looking at this game and it's quite interesting. And if I had a PC, I would probably be playing it. Yes, guys, much love to all of your faces. I will see you guys in the next one. Hopefully, I won't be left to my own devices and waffle on about news type stuff and things. Guys, much love from me, Bam. I'm going to get some bacon, actually. That might, that might make me feel better. Right, guys, I'm out. Bye. Hey, I'm Ryan Manning from Bad Rhino Games, here to talk about Rising Tides, set in the Age of Nautical Dominance, here on Bamster's Rated R Show. And we're back for another interview. Yes, everybody, it's me, G. And um, before we get into who the interviewees are, here's Booker. Yay, yay. You all must have been bad in a previous life, because I came back. Sorry about that. <laughs> Oh, Booger, we love you. So today, I guess we have Ryan Manning from Bad Rhino Games here to talk about a little sailing game called Rising Tides. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Ryan. Welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So, Ryan, first questions. What is Rising Tides? Uh, Rising Tides is a game that we're currently developing right now. Uh, it's an open world RPG set in about the 1600s to 1800s. Players will embark on a journey to discover clues about the disappearance of their late uncle and kind of the mysteries surrounding uh, surrounding that disappearance as well as the Dead Fleet, uh, which are a cursed race of sailors, merchants, and former living persons. Former living persons. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to chuckle about that when I, uh, when I read it. And, um, yeah, it uh, actually sounds like a really interesting concept. There's been a couple of other kind of Sailly piety games out and about there uh, in the last year or two. How long have you been in development? We've been primarily in development now for about uh, just a little over a year. Okay. 
And uh, is this, uh, were you an existing game company or uh, did you all come together uh, through a love of rigging? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, uh, yeah, Bad Rhino, this is, this is our first game as a studio. Um, and, and as far as the team goes, uh, we, there were a few of us that knew each other up front, uh, but for the most part, the entire team has been kludged together from people that we never really met until this project. Kludged, an amazing new word that we've just added to the <laughs> English dictionary by the sounds of it. Uh, do we have a definition? Uh, kludged means the <laughs> formal gathering and coming together of people for cool things. <laughs> there, you, there you go. Who says you don't learn anything on Bamster? Right. So, uh, <laughs> inventing languages as we go along. Yeah. Now, Ryan, and, I don't believe uh, well, you're the only person here, are you? Who, who else have we got there? No, I actually got um, Zach here as well. Hi, Zach. Oh, oh. Hi there. And uh, what, it, what insignificant role do you play within your team? Well, according to Ryan, none. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I am the brand communications manager for Bad Rhino Games. What I'm, what that really means is I'm involved in all the promotion and the marketing uh, for not only Rising Tides but the studio in general. Roger, and does is that keeping you busy right now? Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> this is a huge project, and especially with it being Bad Rhino's first staple, and what we hope to be a very long, uh, long career. It's a lot of setting up, a lot of setup work. To get everything accomplished well um yeah in development for a year already now i i don't know a lot about developing games but i've i have some insight a probably a year into development is really really early days right and i presume that's where you still are right now yes yeah absolutely that is correct yeah and how long do how long do you think before we start seeing any moving images demos um well, yeah, yeah well without without promising too much we're 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 really shooting for fingers crossed that we'll be able to have something out by the end of this year if not a little bit sooner uh that really just kind of showcases what we've been working on mm -hmm. and because your concept art on your website i mean looks looks absolutely beautiful but it is concept art i mean how close to those sort of fidelity are you striving for yeah that's that's always something that's interesting because you know you're, you're absolutely right like sometimes concept art is you know completely way off in left field um mm. I, I can say that from the concept art that we've put together, we we are trying to kind of adhere to the look. So we want, you know, that that realistic vibe, you know, want it to look beautiful, to be immersive um, with with some of those like fantastical elements. What I mean by that is, you know, like some things that might be a little bit more hyper realistic. So I, I guess to answer the question is short. It's, you know, we're trying to stick real close to the concepts, um, but, you know, obviously it'll be, you know, slightly different because it'll be 3D. It will be moving. Hmm. And, and the scale of the world itself. Now, you know, when you're sailing, um, you can cover vast distances, obviously. I mean, how are you managing that? Does, what sort of scale are we looking at? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure I don't, I don't promise too much here because I'd, I'd be sticking my foot in my mouth. Um, that is <laughs> one of the things that we've looked at as well, you know, because we... With with the nautical based stuff, so where you are sailing, we do want it to be something that you know players can enjoy, and you feel like you know you're you're covering those distances. I don't have like an exact figure on the size of the world, but I can say that you know players will be able to spend you know some time sailing in the open waters, but then you know eventually kind of traverse back to the land. That's that's really where the core of the game occurs is more the land based stuff with some nautical based elements in there as well. Ah, okay, so plenty of land based adventuring. Yes, absolutely. See, I want to I want to jump in and just ask a question. Say, since you can't say how big, you know, are we talking? Are we stuck within the you know the British channels, or are we stuck in an area <laughs> the size of the Spanish Main? Hmm. I see. This this is where I'm trying to be careful in this one because you know part of part of what we have here as well. You know, we've we've been doing some testing on our side internally to figure out you know how how big can we push the world within the hardware limitations that we have. You know, without sacrificing you know the the immersion and the story that you'd be able to you know get enveloped in with the land based stuff. So I, I would say that. I mean, safe bet is probably closer to like the English Channel style, you know, where it's a little bit closer. Uh, but again, that's why I'm, I'm trying to make sure I don't promise too much because, you know, we are looking at how far we can expand that without, you know, causing major buggy issues. No, so you're not considering uh, it's not like a procedurally generated sea. You're with a, you're in an map of a specific dimension. So that's yeah, that's probably that's probably the safest way to to yeah. go about it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Cool. And uh, are we talking about islands dotted about the place or just one large landmass? Uh, actually, both of those. So, you know, one of the things that we're, we're trying to do is we, you know, the, the game will have an, an underlying narrative and, 
you know, we we felt that, you know, especially early on in some of our testing um, and, and early gameplay stuff that, you know, having having a good size kind of central island or at least something that you can kind of call, you know, home base, uh, we, we really... We, we determined that that was actually real important to make sure that, you know, we were driving the story elements and the things that we were trying to portray. And, you know, of course, giving players a, a great experience. However, um, you know, for also some of the mystery, the, explore, the exploration style of the gameplay, we will have, you know, islands kind of dotted throughout as well that, uh, that there may be some, some hidden treasures or different things that they can, they can discover there. Ooh, we're all about the hidden treasure. You know it. <laughs> so, so, so we're interested in uh, and yeah so we're, we're talking rpg we're talking exploration in a fixed world um, or a fixed size world but backed by a strong story now is this something are you creative juices flowing as far as putting the story ju- together or is somebody writing the story for you yeah so um the, the story itself you know we've we we have a a great backstory and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how much I can allude to but you know there's there's a lot of elements there's you know we with with rising tides we really wanted to capture you know the the essence of the the nautical age you know so sailing you know pirates the the open seas you know you've got that that exploration that adventure and we wanted to inject some of the more mythical elements you know from from that era so you know like the the sea creatures the the dead things you know like the the typical myths and stories that sailors would come up with and so we wanted to bring those two elements together to create this beautiful world, which eventually, you know, is is rising tides. You know, so so you'll be able to see those aspects in there and, and continue to play with it, if that if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yes, and the Dead Fleet sounds like a pretty interesting concept. What we're we talking about with the Dead Fleet. So, so with the Dead Fleet, you know, we we didn't want to go the typical route of you know like zombies or you know skeletons or something like that. <laughs> and I know we joked in the beginning a little too bad you kind of like the the former living persons. Former um, living, <laughs> but you know, it's logically challenge. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but what what we wanted to do with the Dead Fleet is we we wanted to capture this. Um, you know, part of the storyline without going without without giving too much is that you know th- there's some there's some things that lead up to the reasons why people become the dead fleet and you and so you know there's there are these these tiebacks to the fact that they they were living at one point but they've since changed and you you've got this kind of this this purgatory this constant you know just just gnawing at them that turns them into these kind of they're not dead but they're not living um like i said you know staying away from the zombies but they they have a very very critical importance to the storyline um you know so naturally they are the antagonist to uh the whole story Ah, so they're they're not just a a, a gameplay uh, mechanic. They they figure in the backstory, and they're they're going to have a influence on your your progression and story through the game. Exactly, exactly. Mm. Sorry, if if we have these, I assume they're sailors, this dead fleet, who are people who were living, are living, slowly becoming not living. Didn't Disney make a movie out of that? Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of. I, I will I will say this though that, that the one main difference we have from Disney is that our, our guys will be scary as hell. <laughs> they're they're not just the, the typical lovable, you know, hey, you can go up and hug them. <laughs> yeah, it might be. Yeah, I wouldn't was... hug, hug Bill Nahi's character. That face with all the tentacles? No, not huggable. N- yeah, he could keep <laughs> he could keep all the hugs from those. I can tell you. And, um, so that's that's interesting because there is something else I've noted from your write up of your game and from some of the previous games that I've played. It's uh, where you're talking about progression and the fact that your progression could be lost with a untimely death, you know, or mm-hmm. or something going in the game. Are we talking about? actually having your ship sunk from underneath you and you no longer own them anymore or i mean how are you working that kind of things yeah so that that's something we've looked at which i i, I think the the term that a lot of people use is like permadeath which means mm-hmm. you know like you die it's gone yeah. um and that is something that we we felt was really important to the game to the core storyline because we didn't want to go necessarily to like that that extreme hardcore side where you know like that's it you know it's 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 you get it, you lose it, you're done. But at the same time, we really wanted to challenge the player as they're playing the game to think about their choices, their consequence. You know, hey, do I just run into this pack of dead fleet and just, you know, hey, let's go for it, <laughs> you know, the die. Um, so so we really wanted to challenge them. We felt that that, you know, using kind of that permadeath system was a great way to get them to start thinking about their choices in game. 
Uh, I, yeah, and it really, really piques my interest because I think, um, uh, you know, many games try to do this and some actually have just a hardcore mode or something and a, mm. and a light mode of it uh, so it doesn't come too frustrating to your casual gamer. But it just adds something to a game, I think, when you're in the heat of a battle or whatever you're doing and the, the consequences of losing are real, you know. Yes. Many, many hundreds of hours possibly of game time on the line as you try and complete something. I mean, it's a difficult line to not cross or cross, isn't it? I expect. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and I imagine you're iterating on that as you as you go along. I mean, would you do two modes or you just want to keep it what it is? Yeah, you, you know, on? yeah. And, and I, I, in some of our, like I said, you know, really, really early on in, in gameplay testing right now, you know, but that is that is something that we've thought about because, you know, personally myself from playing games too, you know, especially when you get in those games, like like you were saying, that are just purely focused on hardcore mode, it gets almost frustrating to the point that you, you hate the game. Cause you're like, oh, yeah, I just, you know, I just, all I'm trying to do is just move past this. I, I don't really suck that bad, you know? And, and, and so, you know, we, that's one of the things we were looking at and, you know, we have absolutely thought about, you know, especially for, you know, less seasoned game players, mm. if that's the proper term for them, you know, like people, people who really want to enjoy the storyline, but they don't want to have those consequences of losing everything. So noobs. we have looked at that. What was that? You mean noobs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, politically correct. <laughs> Noobs. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, but yeah, absolutely. We we wanted to make sure that the, the game was still enjoyable for them and they weren't penalized because, you know, they weren't up to the, you know, the, the professional standards that you you have to be an expert at playing games. No, that's true. And because it is difficult because I, I presume or I maybe I presume too much, but generally I I would imagine you would want people to be customizing and upgrading their ships and equipment. And that can be a lot of time and effort and mm. not necessarily something you want to lose in yeah. one fell swoop so i could you know when, when you're talking about a big item like a ship that's that's something you've got to be very careful about making the game unpleasant just from being sunk by an ai somewhere yeah exactly yeah and that and that was a big thing too we want to make sure that you know i mean really really at the core of the game we want them to be enveloped by the story the lore, the, you know, what, what the world is all about. We don't want them to be tripped up over, you know, you know, the game isn't a, you know, a, a ship building simulator, you know, it's, no. it's really about the story. And so, you know, that's something that we're doing, especially on, you know, with internal gameplay testing and stuff like that is to make sure that we don't detract from that envelopment of the story, uh, mm -hmm. just to have some kind of mechanic. No, yeah, very sensible. And of course the story is important, but will there be a PVP element or is that just not even in the picture. So, so something I can say right now is that no, there is not. Um, and, okay. and the the primary reason for that is you know because I mean we we are a a lowercase AAA studio. I mean we are we are an indie startup at the core, and you know one of the things that we're trying to make sure we keep a healthy balance on, uh, especially for you know the fact that Rising Tides is our first launch title is is making sure that we don't overpromise too many features and we get bogged down by, you know, years of trying to get something to work. Um, and, you know, especially from a multiplayer aspect or player versus player, there's a lot more mechanics that have to be built in up front. And, you know, especially right now, we're, we're sticking with that single player mode, again, just so we can really invest more time into the world, you know, the the things that you see, the way you interact with that, without having to just get bogged down with trying to make sure multiplayer works, if we get servers up, how do they work, so on and so forth. An eminent sensible, if you ask me. I mean, so many games uh, could totally bogged down in lag issues and connectivity and, you know, should we go peer-to-peer? -peer? Do we have servers here? Do we have servers there? Yeah. So um, you save yourself a massive headache, I would imagine. Yeah. Well, and that's the hope, like I said, I mean, really at the core, you know, especially with this being our launch title, we want, we really want players to just, uh, to feel and to capture the beauty of the world and this, you know, th this whole story that we're, we're creating. And it, and it does look beautiful. Like if, uh, you know, from your concept art, if your, if your aspirations are uh, as good as your artwork, then uh, it'd be something definitely to be looking forward to. And I kind of like focused on a lot of the sea stuff, but you you were telling me earlier on that the majority of your, or a good part of your adventuring is on two feet. I mean, how are you presenting that? Is it third person, first person, isometric? Yeah, so uh, for this one in particular, we're sticking with third person perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, we'll be that over the camera shot. We we have a few elements that I don't want to say they're a hybrid, but um, as an example, you know, players will be able to in game get pistols, so flintlock pistols, and uh, so you know, we've we've incorporated some elements that you know the camera gets a little bit closer, so you can see you know as you're shooting, but you know it, it all still takes place from a, a third person perspective. 
Yeah, and so like um, aiming down the sights or whatever, you know, that's pretty standard uh, fare, isn't it? And um, are we just talking shooting, melee combat, or are we? Uh, is it all about exploration, climbing? I mean, how are we interacting with the world around us? Yeah, so so pretty much all of the above. I mean, players. Uh, one of one of the things that we we really hit on hard at the start was to to make sure that you know we didn't uh, we didn't segregate our our player base to just being one thing. You know, like it's not just you're you're running, you're gunning, uh, you're not running through swords. You know, players players actually get the chance to kind of choose a little bit how they progress through the game. Um, you know, we'll have hand to hand combat, melee combat. Players can choose you know to kind of avoid that, take more of a stealth route, so they can you know try. To avoid combat exploration is definitely a key part of the game players will be presented with challenges that they have to go find things and it's not the you know hey here's the point in space it's exactly where you need to go uh, it will require them to to hunt for things to search for things um and still avoid you know getting getting engaged with dead fleet uh and, and other enemies in the game to uh you know to to can complete the quest and, and continue to move on mm-hmm. lara croft meets jack sparrow yeah it's <laughs> a good one. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm buying into that. It sounds really, uh, really, really interesting. And uh, and uh, we have our dead fleet. I presume we'll we will have just normal, honest to goodness, bad pirates. Um, <laughs> any other interesting enemy types we might need to know about? I think I think those are those are two of the safe bets we can we could admit for right now. Uh, but yeah, those I, I think that the the dead fleet's really the core kind of an antagonist to our story. Uh, pirates have a fun little 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 bit in there as well. Um, as as I kind of said before too, with you know we're we're really trying to stay away from the stereotypical you know like oh it's pirates you know give me your booty um, you know <laughs> we're we're really trying to like stay away from that. But uh, at the same time you know. Uh, because you, you mentioned the pirate things, just tangent on this one, that, uh, you know, we really tried to capture some of what pirates actually were. So from a historical perspective, you know, they weren't they weren't the, you know, swashbuckles, you know, singing shanties and, and stealing booty. Like they, they actually were people trying to make it. And so, you know, we've tried to inject a little bit of more of that that human factor in them and give them a little bit more of an edge uh, as you, you know, you might engage with them in combat and you might not. It just really depends. Don't you make me start liking pirates. They're always the bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you got anything you want to ask, G? Well, I want to get back into, just if I may, the whole the setting. Because you already mentioned, you know, it's uh, what, late 1600s, early mid 1800s. So, you know, that, that period with the nice tall ships, the wooden ships, lots of cannons firing. Although you say we might not need those against pirates so much. But then the dead fleet and there's some magic and all that. And, you know, is this set in a location? Is it set in a scenario that we had here on Earth? Or are we talking a little bit more um, fantasy world? I, I will say that it's definitely more grounded in real world stuff. Now, you know, we're not doing the typical like, you know, hey, it's just in the uh, the Caribbean. Um, you know, part of part of our initial we, we do I I think in film they call it scout location, you know, where you go and you look at different places to do things. And and we took a lot of cues from um like Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, the Caribbean. Uh, what you know, what we were really looking for and and kind of what we're injecting into this final look of the game is it, you can definitely tell that it takes place in, you know, um uh, you know, more more like places around the equator, but we're bringing in a lot of those like um, environmental details, like you know, huge columns of rocks, you know, and really just creating this you know, almost hyper realistic world, but is definitely grounded in physical locations around the world. Well, I would say it also kind of affects the whole, you know, the ships and everything in the game around it. One of the pictures, as Boog already mentioned, they looked awesome. But one of them, as far as I can tell, is an old merchantman. Um, but if you've been looking to the east, I would think you were going to see uh, old yunks or junks, you know, ships from that period, ships from that area. Mm. How how far are we going? Are we going to see just European ships or eastern ships? Are we going to see canoes? Because they, for some reason, <laughs> were also quite popular. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um I, I I think that it goes back to kind of you know our our overarching art style for the entire game is that you know we we don't want to be segregated to a specific thing you know so we're not going to do like a like a French sailing ship or you know a, a, an English merchant ship what what we've looked at doing is is pulling together the elements of you know that that whole time period so you know there there was a lot of a lot of innovation that occurred during that time on sailing ships and so we try to pull a lot of those elements that create beautiful ships so something that you know you that players will not only have fun with but they you know they don't feel like it's just a massive behemoth tank uh, but it doesn't feel like you know like a little dinghy either you know so it's something it's something kind of in between that allows them to have fun to have that sense of personalization with the ship and then like you guys said as well 
you know, there will be challenges as they're sailing the ship. Like they've got to avoid obstacles and make sure they don't damage their ship, capsize their ship, uh, you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, we're, to, to answer the question, I guess that the short answer is, you know, we're, we're bringing together a lot of inspiration from sailing ships from that time period to create kind of our own unique take on sailing ships. Ooh, that's kind of nice because I'm old enough that I played Sid Meier's Pirates, or as it was known back then, just Pirates. And I mean... <laughs> Back when it was on a Commodore 64, and we would have you no know, books, and we would nerd out in the library about the different ships and locations and what have you. So it, it's interesting for me to see, you know, what way are you going? Are you going to, you know, follow the ships or not? And hearing that, you know, you, it will be your take on things that are historical correct, but you might walk a little bit different. That's kind of kind of interesting. I would also think um, it's one of those areas where you can have some of the, you know, the challenges, the puzzles that. As you say, you don't want to capsize your ship. Well, perhaps there are some shoals that you need to cross and you don't want to take a big heavy ship. You want to take something lighter, but that, of course, makes you more vulnerable. So I would hope you kind of include that as well, you know, with the challenges of the different ships and the advantages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you're you're exactly right. Uh, that is that is very much the things that we have we've been thinking about, and we've been making sure that you know we implement it correctly, uh, so players do have those constant challenges. So are we talking uh, like uh, will there be crew that you need to manage, or is it just about you're on a ship and you're steering it um, and saying pressing fire when you need to fire, or or are we is the crew animated? Is it all part of the game? Booga, just admit it. You want to shout at the crew. <laughs> yes, yes, of course I do. <laughs> so, so that that's something right now that I I will say that I I cannot say yay or nay that will be in the final game. And the reason why I say that is because you know that's something that we're looking at and we're testing internally right now. You know, there's there's a lot of things this you know that that we're making sure works and makes sense. I I will say that we are exploring the idea of of having a crew and, and not just from a visual perspective but you know like they actually they actually do something on your ship you know i.e you get a bigger ship you need more crew so it's a little bit more complicated again challenging to think should you go with a bigger ship or a smaller ship you know so i i can say that i can't promise anything at this juncture uh but it is something that internally we're we're testing and we're, we're kind of playing with the idea mm. no, and that I, I i kind of links with my next question actually is that the actual progression of your character within the game is i mean we're you know we all know about getting you know whatever you want to metric you use xp i mean points money wealth whatever is it like a career progression as well as a just get better gear progression so one of the things that again that we we really determined up front is that we never wanted to have a a system a progression system that was just there for its sake like we didn't want players just to progress because you know it's what you're supposed to do as as the player progresses, you start to unfold more of the story. You, are, you start to unfold more of the mystery and you start to determine why things have happened, what's happening, so on and so forth. And so, you know, players players will advance through that. Now, now something that kind of goes back to what we had talked a little bit earlier, you know, one aspect of our game that we wanted to make sure players had the option of doing was this exploration, you know? So say they, you know, they're tired of the combat and they want to just go take a break and, and kind of just explore. They'll still be able to get that experience, unlock things, you know, get get ship parts, upgrades, better weapons, you know, things that kind of help them progress better through the story. And so, um, you know, those those elements will be in there for the player. Um, but again, you know, the the whole progressive element has a very, very distinct purpose in unfolding the story. So probably career progression as well then i don't i mean if we're following a story or or not you know yeah 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 that's probably safe to say i know there's certain things you you're unable to say and that's fair enough i mean i'm not trying to winkle secrets i'm just trying to (laughs) find stuff out about your interesting game so it'd be nice to uh, uh, start off kind of, you know, nice to be starting off as a cabin boy and end up as Admiral of the Fleet, you know, you know, <laughs> yeah. as a, you know, stereotype. But yeah, yeah, I can tell you too that, and that's and, and that's one of those things that you know, for Rising Tides in particular, it's not like like the core is not about you know your your progressing through the ships. I mean, the ships play a a part of unfolding the story, the bigger story, but you know, really, really at the core, it's more about the story element rather than you know the uh you know be- becoming a ship sailor simulator <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah there's a few of those around already you know we can get that somewhere else can't we and i think that was kind of what drew me to your concept really was we're doing this in an rpg setting it's very story driven and i haven't got to be get good enough at this game to beat other people on a pvp server you know yeah and, uh, uh, so it sounds pretty cool to me 
Well, talking of you know the progression in the game and all that, uh, we're only looking for an uncle, right? Because in Pirates, I remember we had to find our brother, our sister, our mother, our father, our uncle, and 17 <laughs> other family members that just all of them gotten lost in the Spanish main. Right. Yeah. So, so the the uncle in particular is is kind of the uh, we'll call him the North Pole of the story. Like he is he is a you are trying to figure out what has happened to your uncle, but along the way you kind of start to unfold more of the mystery of why he disappeared, where he went, what's happened to him. You know, so he he kind of becomes your your guide pole, like what you're what you're aiming for. But as you progress, things start to make more sense as you discover more clues and things like that. And that's about all I can say about those. <laughs> Secret, secrets. Uh-huh. Well, that's a tr- the only trouble with coming in early on a game development is that if you're interested, it just oh, it takes ages to find <laughs> out the stuff you really want to know about. Oh. Um, yeah. yeah, believe believe me, we, we're chomping at the bit to to let the world know, too. It's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it can be, and, and very nerve-wracking as well. But I, I suspect, um, as we have got early enough in the story, that uh, maybe we'll uh, take the opportunity to speak to you again when we're, we're about to... F- find out a lot more maybe when you're doing a release or an early release and we'll we'll update we'll come and get an update on your progress oh absolutely sounds cool look i have a problem uh yeah i know you have mate <laughs> uh, we don't want to talk about that in public well i, I ran out of rum i'm, I'm out of rum <laughs> <laughs> why is it always the rum uh, when, uh can't we have pirates that are just like a bit of Deserano or something or um um you know how it's the quattro supplies going and uh, build that Ooh. into your new game doesn't always have to be run does it Mm. <laughs> I don't think they're feeling that. Oh no, we ran out of white wine on our ship. I don't think that's going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, okay, well, I think um, I pretty much uh, uh, covered because obviously the amount of information you can give um, is available is fairly limited right now. But definitely um, piqued my interest. Hopefully, we've piqued the interest of uh, people who take the time to to listen to our podcast. I suppose it's down to G whether we've got anything else to ask other than the normal closes. Do you know what? I'm just going through it. I mean, when we look about this game, it uh, when we look at it on the websites and everything you've said, you know, it has all those classical elements. You hunt treasures, you complete quests, you unlock wealth and upgrades. And, you know, there's ships. What more can you want? But there's also the whole running around, which kind of has me interested. But again, there's limited to how much I guess Ryan can talk about it. Yeah, I mean, what, like, so, so I guess what, what are some of the questions you have about, you know, running around? No, but it's, again... The moment I saw this, I had flashbacks to, again, playing pirates. And mm. it got annoying that there was only so much. There were the sword fencing, and I guess in the later version, there was some dancing with a governor's daughter. You're not going to include that, are you? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh, I want to do the hornpipe, man. That's got to be That's got to be like um, uh, <laughs> a timing game or something, a little side game. I want to dance the hornpipe as a pirate. Maybe um, maybe we could throw that in as a, as a random side quest. <laughs> as a, as a stre- well, I would say a stretch goal, but you're not actually stretching. You're not, you're not doing it that way, are you? You're not developing that game through Kickstarters or anything? crowdfunding Ooh, well that's that's actually interesting you guys mentioned that because um that is actually something that we're we're looking at doing here i can't i can't give a definitive date but uh pr- pursuing the crowdfunding route is actually something that's that that's definitely hot on our uh hot on our plate right now well it's always difficult to develop especially if you've got high aspirations a game you know because it does take years to develop a decent game i mean who's you got to put bread on the table and you, you mm. know um so uh, a lot of Gaming companies are getting good mileage out of using Kickstarter, and um, the other one we were talking about the other day, G, remind me, Fick? F- yeah, that's the one. <laughs> hmm. And um, so you feel that you may uh, uh, actually be out there kickstarting sometime soon, then? Oh, absolutely. Like I said, I'm, I I can't give a definitive date yet, but it's definitely something we're looking at. And you know, part of part of what ha- has has been, you know, in in our internal discussions has been, you know, if we're going to go that route of using, you know, the crowdfunding, the Kickstarter, you know, we want to make sure that as developers, we're doing our due diligence to the community, you know, without, without soapboxing too long, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of game studios have misused crowdfunding. Yeah. I feel like they've kind of gone out there, they've asked for money and then they kind of, you know, they may disappear, Um, you know, and that's, and that is not anything that we want to convey. Uh, We want to show like, we, we really want to use crowdfunding what it's supposed to be, you know, help, help launch us forward to get, you know, development done faster to get it out sooner, you know, so, you know, players can play it. And so, you know, 
uh, again, what we've been discussing a lot internally is to make sure that, you know, we're being good stewards of, um, you know, the platform and, and, you know, making sure that players understand what we're trying to accomplish, you know, the dream we're trying to build, you know, with the game, uh, and then ultimately, you know, make for a very successful campaign. Well, I think um, developing a game on your own for a year or more would show most investors that you're certainly dedicated to the task and mm. uh, hopefully would have by the time you got to a Kickstarter, and a nice thing about that, I suppose, now it just occurs to me that you would have to show people something about your game. So we would, might get a little bit of a preview, mightn't we? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's really, really interesting. So we must make sure, well, tell us now, in actual fact, um, where people can find you, Twitter, Facebook, um, where are you out on the web, interwebs? Yeah, so so we like to keep it simple. <laughs> not, <laughs> not be over in a data, and maybe, maybe that's a back to being old yeah. <laughs> but um def- definitely on our twitter uh they can follow our our, our studio at bad rhino games uh and then also at at rising tides rpg uh, and then they can of course look for any uh any other information that we post on our website uh bad rhino games.com or rising tides.com smashing thank you so uh so to finish on a high note because we always leave the best to last um, we are particularly interested to know um, your considered opinions on how best to approach the um, the eating of bacon. Mm. I mean, uh, it's something we take seriously here at Bamsters. And um, yeah, uh, it, eating bacon, there is no wrong way as as long as you're eating it. No, no. Uh, favorite way of bacon, mm. crispy, preferably <gasps> around a filet mignon. Ooh, crispy bacon. Mm. But people don't say crispy bacon all that often, but uh, there's a lot of merit to crispy bacon. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, person number two? Yeah, so I'm thinking I'm, I'm on the opposite of Ryan. I love chewy bacon. Well, that's mine. Chewy, chewy bacon. bacon. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> Are we to, I mean, but the, the thing is, though, you can have crispy bacon, but that could be fried crispy bacon, mm. or is it? Or is it grilled crispy bacon? It's it's that slight seared where you still got the juice, the flavor, but it's not burnt. It's kind of sweet. Sounds like that would be grilled because to, if you if you fry bacon crispy, it's it's li- literally crispy fat. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Crispy oil. <laughs> That's what you get, and that just leads us to heart attacks, and nobody wants that. No. Not often. <laughs> so we've got crispy, and we've got chewy, we've got black and white. So to to finish off uh, with our bacon. What beer would you put with that? Where do you stand with the beer question? Mm. Or rum or cider. Let's be oh, fair. yeah. Or Desirano or Quattro. Mm. Uh, uh, oh, what about beer. whiskey? Can we do, can we do whiskey? Uh, I'm afraid the rules are beer, to be quite often, to be quite honest, yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Hefeweizen guy myself. I, li- oh, I like the lighter summer beers. Hefeweizen. Hefeweizen. It sounds like you're threatening me. Sorry, I just wanted to um, <laughs> clarify. It's no, one of those no. white bread German beers. It's, ooh, no thank you. Mm. Yeah. Yep, it's, oh. it's a light, crispy beer, usually served with an orange slice. Oh, mm. straight, straight out the fridge? Oh, yeah. It's got to be cold. Oh, well, it's making me feel thirsty even thinking about it. Mm. And, uh, and where do you stand for, on the beer question? Um, I stand... With a blonde ale, very similar to Ryan. Say something a little lighter, <laughs> crispy. Like it where she's uh, got tall legs. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> you always have more fun with blondes, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. I really piqued my interest about your game. I hope if you um, go down the crowdfunding route that we hear about it and we can help you along the way. Uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to us and we'll, we'll look forward to your progress in the months to come. Cool. Thanks, G. Thanks, Booker. Thank you. Thank you very much.